suggested that you'd like to see me talk rather than just listen to me talk, so maybe kind of experiment with that format today uh, in this video on the evolution of U.S. combat helmets. Um, not going to do any rations today, I don't have quite the time to dig into a ration, although I have some good ones lined up for you guys. I got a couple vintage RCWs, some LERPs, some MCIs, MREs, and I got some cool stuff planned for those tied in with different bits of history, uh, even a Polish ration coming up. I'm going to tie it into some World War II history. But today, you know, I just wanted to talk about some gear. Look behind me, you can see some of my collection on the wall back there. Um, but the U.S. first introduced a combat helmet uh, in World War I, copying the British design. Um, uh, their Mark I helmet, which then became the 1917 U.S. use. Um, and those helmets stayed in service to the early part of World War II. Um, I think there was a couple million produced in the early part of, of World War II um, before the M1 would replace it, but we'll take a look at that helmet. As you can see, it's sometimes called the Tin Hat, the Brody helmet. Uh, this one's a relic condition, it doesn't have a liner or anything, but this helmet was primarily designed for trench warfare because if you're down in a trench and you're standing on you know, the trench, it'd be about just above your head and guys, there would be steps to look up over and go over the top, but you were meant to walk within the trench and have complete cover from enemy fire coming from, uh, you know, from the front. So but they would use air burst shells or even shells impacting the ground. Debris is going to be coming in this way, not so much, um, you know, horizontally. So that's what this helmet's primarily designed for. And it did a fairly good job of it, um, especially the U.S. version kind of had proved metal over the, uh, the British version, uh, a manganese alloy that provided decent ballistics. But what they found was that World War II was going to be a much more mobile type of conflict and they needed a better helmet that provided better protection all around the head rather than something that's just kind of like a construction helmet to prevent things coming down from above. Um, and those experiments started in the late part of World War I and into the 20s, but uh, interwar funding was pretty low, so it never really got started until the beginning of World War II. Um, starting in 1942, they adopted the M1, which everyone's pretty much familiar with, but um, you can see, this one's not quite adjusted to my large noggin, but the M1 provides better all-around protection. It's got a brim up front for shade, you know, from the sun. The lips around the edge, you know, that provides protection from rain, and the dome shape is good at deflecting shells. Uh, and, you know, bullets coming in, these wouldn't stop direct rifle fire. However, um, glancing blows and small caliber rounds, I've watched ballistic tests on these with pistol calibers, and uh, they do a decent job of st stopping small arms. Um, and you'll read accounts from World War II Vietnam of them stopping distant rifle cartridges. They, because of the round dome shape, they would glance off as part of the reason. The other reason is the U.S. had gone with a two-part design, and the early liners, like this one, were pretty much a, uh, a plastic uh, fiberglass 
um, material. The early, early ones, like 42, are paper, like a resin paper, and they didn't hold up. So then they went to this kind of, and you can see that fiber layer impregnated with the plastic. Um, it's pretty lightweight, and the liner itself served as a hard hat, a sun helmet, um, and the liner coming out would allow you to use your, your pot as a pot, a shaving uh, helmet, you could dig with it, you could bail out your trench and just rained and filled with water. Um, but that two-piece design meant that if it penetrated the metal, what would happen was sometimes it would either stop in that fiber because, you know, from ballistic nylon vests like what were used in Korea and Vietnam and later Kevlar, that, that woven material can have a ballistic protective um, effect. If it didn't stop it, it would sometimes enter and glaze off. It would ride along and come out the other side. And I read a count from Vietnam of that case. So if you're looking to pick up an M1 and you're looking for World War II, there's some things to look for. Mainly, a front seam indicates pre-45 production. Uh, in 45, they went to a rear seam. I'm talking about right here, you'll see a seam on the helmet. Um, early ones will have a fixed bail. The bail is where the chin strap attached. Um, this one was a fixed bail and then it was repaired with swivels and that's why they went away from the fix. Guys would like to sit on these on the ground and it would break those chin strap bales off so then they went to a swivel bail. So this is an early uh, probably a 42-43 production M1 um, and they went pretty much unchanged through their whole service life. Uh, they weren't fully phased out until the late 1980s. I recently did a survey on Facebook with some veterans and there was guys said there they had them up right up until Desert Storm when they finally got their first Kevlars, although the Kevlar was introduced as early as 83. Um, so the helmet, over time they introduced different camouflage covers. Uh, in Korea, they intended to ship over a just plain green cover um, but most of the supplies didn't make it over. The ship sunk in a storm. But the covers were because they came out with those because if you look, see how that shines? That's not good. You know, that moonlight and everything, even sunlight in the day, that gives away your position. So they came out with a variety of different camouflage covers. This Mitchell pattern is kind of indicative of Vietnam. We have a I have a late war Marine Corps pattern here. Um, in in the sixties they went with a nylon liner. Looks a little different, you can see from the, that earlier one I showed you. This was a nylon impregnated liner and that probably, although I don't know for sure, but would have provided even better secondary protection because it's impregnated resin nylon and that would have been almost like your later British ballistic nylon helmets or like the ballistic nylon in the flak vest. So um, it wasn't really intended for that but it was kind of a secondary benefit of having that two-piece uh, liner. Um, as the helmet the M1s, you know, they did a production 42 to 45, and then they 66 and 67, I believe, and that was it. But they stayed in service through the, like I said, the late 1980s, and they were refurbished and updated. Here's an 80s production one. It's got the Woodland BDU cover on it. And um, this liner, I believe, has a contract date of 1984, so it's a late production liner. And its style is a little different even than the Vietnam one. The suspension's mainly the same, but the webbing is held in by these little removable clips rather than being just riveted in. I guess that was for a better service. And you can see even the, uh, the fiberglass and nylon's a little different color. And this one, underneath the cover, is in really nice shape. And that's, you know, they would send these back and, and refurbish them. And so, you, you know, you might have had a helmet made in the 60s. You might have had a helmet made in the 40s because they just kept using them until they were eventually phased out for the uh, the PASCET helmet, which I'll show next. PASCET stands for Personal Armor System Ground Troops. And those went into, um, they were experimenting with those post-Vietnam with a ballistic nylon and then Kevlar uh, helmets. Um, and the experimental ones were actually like painting camouflage. But eventually they settled on sticking with the old OD green textured paint and then went with various camouflage covers. So they could come in anything 
We got this one here with the six color desert. This is kind of indicative of the Gulf War era. Everyone's kind of seen that. And the design really was inspired by the German Stahlhelm from World War I and World War II. You know, you have that brim up front like the M1, but you have even better side and neck protection here. And um, additionally, the Kevlar material provided far better ballistics than the steel. While the steel was good, this weighed the same amount as the M1, but this would stop bullets. I mean, not direct rifle fire, though I've seen, once again, where these have uh, taken hits uh, from rifles. And actually, in the manual I have for a later production one, it talks about a guy taking a sniper hit from an AK in Grenada. So they did provide far superior protection. When these first came out, though, in the 80s, guys that were turning in the M1s noted that you couldn't really use it as a pot anymore. It's, you know, it's impregnated ballistic fiber, so you can't heat it up like a pot. And the suspension is fixed to the inside, so you can't, you know, put water in it or anything, really. Uh, and they were sized to the person. This is like a small. They came an extra small, I think, up to large. So this one doesn't really fit me. I have a big head. Um, but, for instance... Here's a pasket with the woodland cover, and um, this one does fit me. And you can see how that side protection and everything was uh, superior to that of the M1, and that was really the intention of this helmet. Um, these stayed in service up until the mid-2000s, although uh, replacements started to appear in the late 90s, early 2000s, with the uh, first uh, versions of these, which... Uh, Eventually became known as the uh, ECH, the Army Combat Helmet. Uh, now it's the ECH, which is an even improved version uh, with better ballistics. But this, these ones were made of an improved Kevlar, um, and they had a built-in uh, hole here to mount your night vision optic. The old Pasket, you had to have like a strap that held it on because it didn't have a mounting hole. And these were also improved because they used padding. Inside, this was inspired by NFL football helmets, and it used a four-point harness, which also kept the helmet more stable when it was impacted. So between the improved chin strap and the padding, they were seeing less, uh, you know, cases of TBI and other head injuries when a helmet was struck by a projectile. Now, so this is an earlier one with the woodland cover on it. Um, and here is an example of, a, of the leader model. Uh, this one's only a few years old, and it's in the foliage green color that kind of when they came out with the universal camouflage pattern, and the pads match that. Um, this helmet is light in comparison to the older Pasket or even the steel helmet. Um, so that's, you know, that reduces neck fatigue. And the other thing about these helmets, in addition to being far more comfortable, is they're designed to, like I said, include the... Um, night vision optics, but also, you know, communication, uh, radio headsets, um, and all that. Um, so the helmets just continue to evolve over time. There's also, this has the standard neat strap in the back that just keeps the helmet stable on your head. Uh, there's even a ballistic version of this that provides, you know, protection, even more protection to your head. So the guys over at Natick Labs, Soldier Systems, are always working to give our guys on the ground better protection and that's just a short review of how you know the US ground helmet has um, evolved since uh, you know really World War One the M1 is kind of a timeless symbol of the American soldier it served for a long time because it really was an excellent design only just to be phased out because of better you know technology um, so that's what I got on U.S. ballistic helmets, you know, from World War I to now. Um, I can do another one on, you know, the body armor, the vests that go with it if you guys would like. Or if you see anything around the museum here that you, uh, you want to see, just let me know. And uh, I'm happy to do a video on it. I got some, like I said, some stuff planned with rations, stuff on, uh, you know, Panama, uh, uh, Polish Uprising, World War II. I'm going to tie that in with the Polish ration. Um, some more Gulf War gear and with some early 90s MREs. So just let me know. I like to talk about this stuff. And if you guys like to listen, I'll keep doing it. 
So thanks and have a good day. You've been